Hello, hello. Um, welcome back. Welcome to the third session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. Um, my name is Alec Brown, and uh, I'm a forest and fish project manager here at the Washington Environmental Council. Um, and I'm happy to be assisting with this um, session called Four Climate Tests for Durable Wad Pro Wad Wood Products. Uh, first, a few housekeeping notes, which you might have heard earlier. Uh, if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat uh, box to the right of the webinar. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speaker, please use, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the uh, the speaker at the end of the presentation. Uh, a reminder for you all that the session will be recorded and shared with uh, you all next week. So let's get started. Um, despite recent excitement, durable wood products remain controversial within the scientific community in terms of their net climate mitigation effects. Advocates tout the carbon sink potential of innovations such as mass timber, while skeptics stress the risks of net carbon loss from intensively managed forest landscapes. Moreover, the science has examined a wide variety of uh, forest-based natural climate solutions, generating often competing proposals. Debate over the relative carbon value of passive uh, versus active forest-based natural climate solutions is an example. Um, because of over-reliance on any one natural climate solution, including durable wood products, would carry uh, the risk of unintended consequences. Dr. Bill Keaton has proposed four tests to minimize uncertainty and maximize the potential for ben uh, beneficial outcomes. This session will explore those tests. And you know, I, I, I will just add on um, my own here, you know, you might be wondering why the forest and fish project manager at WBC is talking about this. Um, I was wondering that as well. And I think, a lot of it has to do with the fact that I talk about this a lot with Rachel and she thinks my answers and, and comments are always wrong because because when I was doing the research for this presentation, I thought that Dr. Bill Keaton had a lot of interesting uh, ways to frame this conversation and I hope you will take as much uh, as I have from um, these tests. So uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Keaton now. He is a professor of forest ecology and forestry at the University of Vermont and you um, you know, may be wondering what, uh, if he knows anything about what we're doing here in Washington, and you'll be happy to know he got his PhD at the University of Washington. Uh, and I, I will pass it on to you, Dr. Ke Dr. Keaton. Well, thanks a lot, Alec. It's great to be here with everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, as Alec said, got my start in, out in Washington State uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, I've been in Vermont for more than 20 years since then, but uh, my PhD work was out there in the Southern Washington Cascades, and and uh, I've always been, you know, very closely connected to the forests and forestry issues out in your region. So it's really a pleasure to be back with you today. So um, yes, Michael, if you could please start the slides, that would be great. So I'll just disclose right off the bat that I'm really not a wood products guy. I'm not a materials scientist or an engineer. I'm a forest scientist, I'm a forest ecologist. I do a lot of work with silviculture and I'm a carbon scientist. But in the, the world that I work in of carbon forestry, this issue of wood products has become very important. It's clearly generating a lot of excitement both within the professional sectors as well as the scientific, but it's also generating a fair amount of controversy and I've, I've found my work touching more and more on this in, in, in recent years, both in the Northeast where I am now, a little bit in the Northwest where I, I'm still engaged in a variety of projects and also over in, in Europe, Central and Eastern Europe where I, where I do a lot of work. Uh, folks are talking about this um, in all of those places. And so I've started to think about that. So how do we fold durable wood products, particularly things like cross laminated timber and, and, and mass timber into our overall holistic forest management for, for carbon and for climate. So that's what I thought I'd talk about today. 
but I'll try to put that within this broader framework that your conference is addressing, namely climate friendly forestry, or what I'm, I'm going to call right now climate smart forestry. Maybe this is just indicative of the sort of jungle or, or soup of terminology that, that people are using these days, uh, sometimes to refer to the same things, other times with slightly different meanings, and this can all get quite confusing, which leads to my first slide here, which is simply my attempt to try to make some sense of this field of climate smart forestry that seems to be rapidly developing. Now, just a couple of years ago, we might have called this carbon forestry or, I don't know, adaptive management, or in other sectors, they're talking about na nature-based solutions or um, uh, natural climate solutions. And again, there's overlap between these terms, but this one, climate smart forestry, seems to be getting a lot of traction right now. Uh, again, both in North America and abroad. So, so what does it mean? Uh, so today I'm just going to offer a few thoughts about that. We'll try to put durable wood products within this context. And then at the end, maybe we can have some discussion of this. And I would, I would really welcome your perspectives and maybe kind of collectively we can move this idea forward. So this is mo by no means definitive, but just my attempt to make some sense of this. I see people, again, um, in North America and in Europe, talking about climate smart, smart forestry basically in three ways. So many people use it to refer to climate mitigation. And so there, they're really talking about carbon forestry, um, using forests both on the landscape as well as the products that we generate from those forests to sequester and store carbon and to help mitigate or dampen the intensity of future climate change in that way. But we also see climate smart forestry used a lot in the context of resilience and also adaptive management or adaptive forestry. So here this might include things like fire restoration and fire risk reduction. It might include, but it might include other things like management for complex forest canopies that help buffer microclimates and, and reduce relative humidity beneath those canopies. There's also a whole field of science generating a lot of excitement around the idea of functional plant trait diversity, meaning manage, managing forest ecosystems for very high levels of plant trait diversity that would give ecosystems the, the ability to adapt and change in response to, to climate. But then there's also the operational side of this, what you often see in the profession, profession, where folks are talking about forest infrastructure resilience, the infrastructure of the, of the road system, of our water management, culverts, operational planning, forecasting, uh, uh, you know, uh, hardening our infrastructure, all sorts of things in that context. So we see climate smart forestry used in, in all three of these ways and probably in others. Today, I'm really gonna mainly focus on this uh, uh, leg of the stool, the, the climate change mitigation part, and, and really thinking about natural climate solutions specifically. And, and we're gonna think about durable wood products and mass timber as just one of those, again, within this overall context. We'll also talk a little bit about resilience because of course there's a, a very important connection to that. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, let's just start off with this fundamental point that everybody at this conference understands and that I'm sure you've been talking about the last couple of days, which is that, you know, it's now globally recognized that forests are a natural climate solution, a critical natural climate solution. Uh, the, the estimates vary in terms of the, the overall um, uh, emissions reductions or, or offset benefit of, of natural systems, but basically from anywhere between 15 and 20% of, of our, our global greenhouse gas emissions um, could potentially be stabilized or offset through the use of, of natural climate solutions, including forests. Um, you know, and a, and a lot of this has to do not so much with uh, maybe adding carbon to the forests that we currently manage or sequestering more, but simply in, in reducing the, the rates of forest loss. Like that alone would go a tremendously long way in, in fighting climate change. So this graph 
which comes from all this discussion around the Glasgow Declaration, which is the, the thing that the, the UN member countries and the, and the COP27 have been extremely excited around, the, the idea that reforestation and restoration, but maybe more importantly, just halting global loss of forests could significantly bring down our, our overall, overall global greenhouse gas emissions. It's a critical stabilization wedge, as you're seeing here. <clears throat> so that includes not just things like halting tropical deforestation, but in North America, it includes halting conversion of forest into non-forest uses. Now that's really an important issue almost everywhere. It is in the Northwest. It certainly is in Western Washington, Western Oregon and, and, uh, and your region. It's a critically important is issue in the Eastern US, probably the number one most important issue in terms of what we can do to, to, to use forests to fight climate change. We simply have to, to halt or stabilize the loss of forests through rural and suburban sprawl, that direct footprint of exurban and, and rural sprawl, which is now the, the number one cause of forest loss um, in my region, for example. You folks might not know that beginning in the, the 1980s and the 90s, continuing into the 2000s, New England, my state, sort of turned the corner after 150 years of, of forest regrowth and recovery from 19th century land use all seven New England states are now losing forest cover because of, of rural sprawl, because of housing subdivisions. It has nothing to do with forestry or agriculture or anything else. It's because of subdivisions. So for us, um, conserving forests and just keeping forests as forests is probably the, the number one uh, way in which forests contribute as a natural climate solution. So I wanted to just start with that recognition, but then we're going to talk about a lot of other things as well. So first of all, we also need to think about that, the context that, that carbon markets provide. I'm pretty sure that you've been talking about that in your other sessions and certainly at, at previous iterations of this conference. I also worked in this realm a lot in forest carbon project development, both in the compliance market systems, but also increasingly in the voluntary markets. Both of them provide really critical incentives now for carbon forestry for climate smart forestry, to use that term instead. So you on the compliance side, of course, we have the California market, but we also have the, the New England Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. We have a rapidly developing compliance market in Quebec and in British Columbia and other parts of North America, in, in one that's getting off the ground in, in Mexico. So a lot of activity on the compliance side, probably even more in the over-the-counter um, voluntary market, the international voluntary market system. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today, how we might use the, the carbon projects within those uh, carbon market frameworks as maybe a criteria to evaluate both the climate benefits as well as just the overall sustainability of forest management for durable wood products. So we're going to come back to this point a little bit later. I, I just want to acknowledge now, and, and then I have more slides about this later, that the um, carbon projects and, and markets are, are controversial, in, increasingly so, and 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 this is probably a good thing. You know, we probably need that scrutiny and that pushback to make sure that that the protocol and the standards are as rigorous as possible, and that those continue to improve. I've been working in the sector now for probably more than a decade, and just within that time, I feel as though I've seen. The, the, the baselines, the, the protocol, the accounting frameworks, um, improving all the time and becoming increasingly rigorous. So we've made a lot of, of progress, but there's still clearly a, a long way to go, and particularly around the issue of baselines, but we can talk about that more later. Okay, yes, so um, we have this idea of natural climate solutions as one of the the, the three critical legs of climate smart forestry. We understand that uh, carbon markets are now providing a financial incentive for those things. But what I hope to impress upon you today is that we really need to be thinking about this holistically. We need to be thinking about the forest-based natural climate solutions holistically. And rather than 
putting all of our eggs in one basket and becoming, I'm just going to say it, like overly excited about just one particular strategy, we have to understand that we have a portfolio of carbon forestry options. And all of these things need to work together. And the portfolio idea helps us kind of wrap our arms around the, the public discourse that we're seeing. The, the 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 fact that we have different constituencies arguing for different things and presenting these as though um, it's one or the other, when in fact we maybe as professionals can understand again that we have to take a holistic approach and that there is a portfolio that we need to um, use uh, together simultaneously. So what is that portfolio? This is the way I see it, and I think this dovetails the three basic mechanisms that carbon markets provide for carbon projects. So the first general category is what we would call, you know, avoided land use conversion or avoided deforestation. And in some contexts or under certain carbon market protocol, that can be synonymous with passive management. So this might include things like conservation of high conservation value forests in North America and globally. So things like old growth forests, but also um, rare natural communities and unique habitats of all sorts, unmanaged or lightly managed core reserves, wilderness areas, and a whole range of traditional and indigenous resource uh, areas um, and uses as well. And so this is clearly uh, a, a natural climate solution that ha has high carbon value and high carbon potential. The, the science has explored this in, in great depth. And there are many, including those who are increasingly advocates for what are, some are now calling proforestation. So what many people would like to see and yes, there is carbon value in these approaches. I've done a lot of work on this myself, the carbon value of old growth forests, the carbon sequestration and storage potential of lightly managed or unmanaged reserves. But I think we all have to understand that this also carries risks in the context of invasive species and fire risk reduction and unforeseen climate changes and species migration and range shifts um, and the need for adaptive approaches to, to, to deal with all of those. So again, effective carbon strategy, yes. Do we wanna put all of our eggs in this basket? Probably not. So one part of our por portfolio, but not the only part. So the Glasgow Declaration and many others, of course, stress this one, reforestation, afforestation, and this has huge potential too, the idea of planting and restoring more forests. And again, Glasgow says we need 350 million hectares under active restoration by the year 2030. I hope we can get there. But you know, there are also many parts of the world where reforestation is um, probably going to be a relatively small part of the pie. So for example, in my region where we're about 80% forested, there's limited potential for re reforestation um, with some really important ex uh, exceptions like riparian buffer restoration and lakeshore restoration and uh, urban tree cover is very important or re restoration of, of rare natural communities that have been lost. In my region, we have a forest type called clay plain forest, rare and unique, we need to restore it. So they're, they're, even in heavily forested regions of the world, uh, this is also part of our portfolio. It, it's interestingly also one though that there is skepticism around. Some of you may have seen this article in the, the New York Times fairly recently. Um, saying, yes, uh, reforestation is great and important, but it also carries some trade-offs. For example, if we use it in, a, in parts of the world where it um, reduces albedo, so it, uh, re it reduces reflection of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun and increases absorption of U UV radiation, converting that to long wave radiation or heat that might actually result in local and regional heating. There's a, was a very important paper around that recently looking at the Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's also the concern that 
um, afforestation in some parts of the world. Look at Uruguay, northern Argentina, for example, is, is displacing other native ecosystems in those regions like the pampas and gra grassland ecosystems. So they're trade off with biodiversity in, in some parts of the world. So, you know, as with everything, we have to do this carefully and intelligently and in a scientifically informed manner. And then we come to the final piece in the, the carbon forestry or the natural climate solutions portfolio, which is improved forest management. And this is probably the area in which we've seen the most activity within the carbon markets in terms of the types of products, projects that we're seeing in North America and the types of things that are being incentivized. So this, this includes everything from variable retention harvesting or retention forestry, which of course has become one of the, the dominant ecological silviculture approaches in the Northwest. You're all intimately familiar with this, but also uh, other systems like irregular shelterwood method, sorry, that um, is increasingly of interest to foresters in, in many different temperate regions of the world. So multi-cohort forestry or multi-aged forest management um, that yields biodiversity benefits in terms of structure, um, carbon benefits in terms of long-term retention of structure, i.e. storage, carbon storage in the forest, but is also silviculturally and operationally um, advantageous from a forestry standpoint. We'll just leave it at that for, for the moment. Um, but also under this sort of uh, part of the carbon forestry portfolio, we see lots of other systems that, that folks are experimenting with in, in temperate systems all over the world, expanding gap methods, group irregular shelterwood methods, all sorts of permanent tree retention methods. And then something I've, I've been experimenting with myself in northern hardwood forests, an approach called structural complexity enhancement that uses active silviculture to manage for old forest characteristics and turns out to also have very, very high carbon value. Okay, so we have this portfolio of carbon forestry options. And my point here again is that we're not just gonna pick one of these, we're gonna look at that overall mix and from a sustainability standpoint, we wanna optimize this mix both for climate benefits, as well as for biodiversity and for all the other values that we derive from forests, including wood products. Okay, so durable wood products then is just one piece of all of this. And the folks in the wood products world need to remember that as well, that you know, as, as interesting and exciting as mass timber, timber is, we always need to be thinking it about it in this holistic context. How does it dovetail? How does it complement all of these other pieces? How does it fit within our overall portfolio? Okay, so that brings me to this. So now we're gonna really take that deep dive into durable wood products. Um, so as with the others, uh, passive management, even reforestation, durable wood products is controversial as well. This, by the way, is what makes forestry exciting, right? This is why I got into this field to begin with, that there's, there's always debate. There, there are always different pers perspectives about everything. It's what keeps the science advancing, and we need to continuously have that debate and that discussion. So there is an active debate in the scientific literature around durable wood products. Are they beneficial to the climate? Do they carry risks? There are some paper papers that, that um, emphasize the carbon storage value of large timber frame structures uh, engineered and produced from cross laminated timber. And, and there probably are clear long-term carbon storage benefits from that. There are also papers like this one by Hudeberg et al. Um, focusing on the unintended carbon emissions were we to intensify forest management substantially to produce those durable wood products in that mass timber. So the risk of a net flux of carbon off of the forested landscape that is not entirely compensated for by the increase in carbon storage in durable wood products and in structures. That's the way this 
carbon accounting works. So we see different papers making different arguments, um, generally because they're using different accounting frameworks and they're sort of defining the scope of the system differently. I'm gonna have to just leave it at that right now because this is a, a vastly complicated field. Okay, so given this complexity and given the uncertainty, I've been interested in the question, what can we do to reduce the overall risk of unintended consequences, the overall risk that there would be an unforeseen net carbon flux to the atmosphere. So what can we do to reduce that risk while maximizing the potential for benefits from durable wood products and, and mass timber? Again, within that portfolio approach. So this idea, by the way, of maximizing benefits using a variety of strategies, so durable wood products is part of the portfolio, is called risk spreading. This is a term that David Lindenmeyer and Jerry Franklin coined way back in their 2002 book, um, Conserving uh, Biodiversity in, in Managed Forests. So we're gonna, we're gonna think about this concept of risk spreading. How can we spread the risk using that portfolio? And, and understanding that the carbon accounting is really complicated in terms of the net carbon outcomes of any one particular carbon project. You know, what, what can, can foresters look to and maybe um, architects and urban planners and others, what can they look to as some simpler criteria to understand when durable wood products would provide a net benefit? Okay, maybe that's not the, the, the clearest way of describing why I've pondered this, but, but there you go. So this has led me to this idea of sort of needing a simple set of, of criteria or tests. And I'm calling this the four tests for durable wood products and mass timber. So four simple things we can think about. So number one, and we'll go through each of these in detail in just a minute. Number one, does the production of durable wood products complement other natural climate solutions? So complement but not compete with the other items in our portfolio. <clears throat> Does it contribute to either stable or even better net increasing carbon stocks in the system overall? So by system, I mean the carbon on the landscape in forests, and also the carbon that's moving through the wood products stream, accounting for the life cycle of carbon as it moves through wood products and, and, and then uh, ends up in, you know, in its ultimate fate. So does it contribute to a stable or net increase in carbon stocks? That's essential. And then from a, a more general, just sustainability framework, does it contribute to multifunctional forest management? The other co-benefits that we all know are so important from forests. So water, recreation, biodiversity, uh, aesthetics, uh, uh, and everything else. And then finally, we always have to be thinking about the context of climate change. For this, as with any aspect of, of forestry. So if we're going to stress production of durable wood products, can we use silviculture and management methods that do that, that does that in a way that makes forests more resilient uh, to, to disturbances, to climate, and that makes forests future adapted? Okay, so those are my four tests. We're gonna go through each of those now, and, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of evidence in support of each of these. I, I'll just apologize in advance that uh, most of my slides today are, are uh, East Coast examples. Um, I am familiar with the forestry in the Northwest and would be happy to talk with, with you about that afterwards and would, again, welcome that perspective from all of you. Okay, so the first test, does the production of wood products, particularly durable wood products and mass timber, compete with or complement other climate solutions? Um, I'm sure many of you have seen some of these really cool natural climate solution assessments led by the Nature Conservancy uh, with others um, for the United States. I was part of the team that did this for Canada. We've had one of these globally. They're doing this now for Brazil and other parts of the world. And, and th these are really interesting exercises because they look at the total climate mitigation potential, the co total carbon value of 
basically everything that we can do with land cover and vegetation to mitigate climate change. So both in, in, in forests, but also other sectors like agriculture, grasslands, wetlands, peatlands, coastal resources. And typically, although interestingly not for Canada, but, but typically forests jump out as the, the top ranked natural climate solution. But just again, keep in mind that it's not just one thing. Reforestation often ranks as one of the most important. Avoided forest conversion is also critically important. This, this by the way, is the figure for the United States, the, 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 the numbers for the US. The shading here in these bars represent sort of like the low hanging fruit, the things that we can do easily, and the darker bars are the things that would be more difficult and more costly to do, but trying to understand kind of the maximal carbon sequestration potential of, of these uh, natural climate solutions. Okay, so the point here though, is that to achieve this potential, we need to use lots of different natural climate solutions, including reserves, including conservation of high conservation value forests, including reforestation and avoided land use conversion. So wood products and improved forest management, that's whole side of things, has to fit within this framework. It has to complement these other NCSs and it can't deduct from them. Okay, so that's that's all I'm going to say on on test number one for today. These things have to work in tandem. Test number two, I think we all understand this now that no matter what we do, we 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 maximize the the certainty of climate benefits if we either stabilize the amount of carbon that's stored on the landscape or increase it over time. So in other words, take carbon out of the atmosphere, sequester it, and then store it within the biosphere and in forests, and then also in the wood product stream. So if, if we intensify forest management to, to produce durable wood products, and unwittingly that results in a net loss of carbon stored in the system, that would represent a flux of carbon to the atmosphere greenhouse gas as a greenhouse gas. And we want to avoid that. So no matter what we do, we have to contribute to stable or net increasing carbon stocks. I've looked at this in the Northeast. That's what this graph um, is about. And we've looked at a range of forest management approaches ranging from less intensive to um, less intensive here to more intensive here. Uh, another way of thinking about that is um, more structural retention, less frequent harvests, so things like extended rotations on one end of the spectrum, and the other end being more frequent harvests or shorter rotations with less retention or no retention. And we've looked at this as, as a continuum of opportunities, helping foresters to understand that as they move from one management approach to another, they help add a, an increment or, or a margin of carbon storage to the landscape. And of course, that's what carbon markets call additionality. And that's what they incentivize. That's what they pay landowners for as an offset. So production of durable wood products also needs to be done in a way that adds additionality um, uh, to the landscape. Test number three, if, if we are going to increasingly produce durable wood products in mass timber. Can we do it in a way that is consistent with our overall sustainability objectives, our, our overall multifunctional forest management approach? Will, will there be co-benefits in terms of the, the mix of wildlife habitats that we produce, the, the other types of values like water and recreation? I'm, I'm personally, uh, particularly interested in riparian forests and riparian functionality um, and the, the use of uh, active silvicultural restoration techniques in riparian buffers to improve stream functions. Where I live in New England, this has become one of our number one forest management concerns because of the, the very large precipitation events we've had in recent years, uh, like Tropical Storm Irene in 2012 and other, other hurricanes and, and storms. And, and we understand now that we have to manage our landscapes for flood resilience. So almost everything we have to do 
has needs to be within that context. I've done quite a bit of work on this. I'll just run through some examples. So for example, um, uh, Dominic Tom and I in this paper recently looked at the National Audubon Society's silviculture with birds in mind um, approach. Uh, Audubon has proposed a, a silvicultural guide with a new set of forestry techniques that manage for a wide range of bird habitats. And we took a, a close look at this and we wanted to look at co-benefits and trade-offs in these different approaches for managing for bird habitats. And as you're seeing here with this figure, you know, clearly there are trade-offs between different silvicultural approaches. I mean, foresters know this, of course, but it's it's also true of these newer, more innovative ecological silvical appro silviculture approaches, what we might call natural disturbance-based silviculture, for example. So there are trade-offs, like some systems um, produce favorable outcomes in terms of large trees, others promote early successional habitats, and, and others uh, maybe favor carbon storage. But one of the things that we learned from this was that carbon is actually a very interesting umbrella for a lot of other co-benefits that we care about. So in this figure, you're seeing the relationship between carbon storage in the forest managed using this approach and something called H-index, which is, which is a measure of the structural complexity of forests. And, and what you're just, you're seeing here is that there's a strong correlation between the amount of carbon that is stored in temperate forests and their structural complexity. So if we're managing forests for durable wood products and we're doing that in a way that promotes complexity, we're probably also gonna do a pretty good job of, of providing carbon storage. That's the, the take home from all of this. I've also looked at this specifically in terms of carbon projects. Like, can we develop guides for carbon projects, information that will help guide the development of carbon projects to help us understand where those would have the greatest co-benefits. And again, understanding that durable wood products can be an output of these carbon products projects. If we use the improved forest management approach, that means we can actively manage the forests for carbon as well as wood products. I think everybody understands that. So we looked at that in, in this feasibility study here called the Vermont Forest Carbon Project. And, and we, we conducted a mapping exercise, a spatial analysis exercise to understand where carbon projects would yield the greatest co-benefits. So where could we you know, sequester carbon and produce offsets, generate wood products, but also have co-benefits. So I'll just show you how we did this really quickly. So of course we started with just forest cover for the state of Vermont, uh, that's this. We then defined co-benefits very explicitly. So for us, we were interested in, in a couple of things. I've already mentioned flood resilience is a critical issue for us. And, and fortunately we had this spatial layer from the Gund Institute for Environment that maps the contribution to flood resilience of every single parcel of land on the Vermont landscape, we chose just the 80th percentile of, of those parcels. So the top ranked parcels for flood resilience, <clears throat> that's this. And then we overlaid on that what we call the forest blocks. So Vermont has recently mapped all the large uh, areas of unfragmented interior forest habitat statewide on both federal, state, um, and privately owned lands. And, and this is a great concern for, for, to us from a conservation standpoint, and particularly in light of this forest conversion or forest loss issue that I mentioned to you before that has to do with, with housing, rural housing, so we, we, uh, one of the co-benefits we're interested in is conserving these, these forest blocks. So we asked the question, well, what if we did carbon projects either within those blocks or within a, a mile on, on all sides to, to help buffer those? So if we do this exercise and we look at all the parcels that would be eligible for carbon projects, 500 acres or more in size, at least 75% forest cover, 
and that lie within those polygons, we end up with this estimate of the acreage that would be eligible, most eligible for carbon projects and that would also yield the greatest co-benefits, almost 300,000 acres. So not bad for a small little state like Vermont. And then just to show you how this is played out in the real world, so I'm trying to make this real now, like operational, not just scientific. We then chose one of these regions here, the north, north, northern part of the state, we call this the Northeast Kingdom, um, to develop a pilot carbon project in to, to show how this could work. This region, by the way, that you're seeing here that, that had a number of these highly ranked parcels happens to be an area that um, it, it has already had a lot of work, um, meaning landowners coming together. Again, remember that this is predominantly a privately owned landscape. 80% of Vermont is privately owned, particularly in the Northern part of the state. So an area that in which landowners were already actively working together around stewardship and wildlife conservation and open space conservation and other things. It's, it's a region we call Cold Hollow to Canada. And it's this critical corridor that, that links the, the Northern Appalachians, basically the Green Mountains, up into Southern Quebec, uh, where I am right now speaking to you from Montreal. So we, we chose that landscape here, the, the, the US side of the border, and we developed the, the Cold Hollow Carbon Project, about 9,000 acres bringing together 12 parcels, 10 landowners, and we developed the first large, well, large for us, aggregated carbon project under the voluntary market. So this is the international voluntary market um, using the American Carbon Registry Protocol. And this has been very successful. The project was completed a couple years ago and um, was brought to market. The offsets were sold. They generated something like $3.5 million in net revenue uh, for the landowners. Uh, well, actually 70% of that is going to the landowners. Uh, I'm sorry for that, for that era, error. An average of uh, $282 per acre um, that each landowner will receive. Not bad considering that these lands will be actively managed. They will be continuously um, managed for, for timber in a sustainable manner, providing a whole range of co-benefits, including, by the way, maple sugar production. That's uh, part of this. There are a number of actively managed sugar bushes. So producing durable wood products from these forests while also producing these co-benefits in terms of flood resilience and open space conservation. Um, demonstrating how that can work in a carbon market context. Okay, so um, there's one final, well, I'll just go through this really quickly, just to, just to say that even though I'm excited about the potential of carbon markets to incentivize this type of forestry and the production of durable wood products that also produce co-benefits, we're still on test number three, I'm also cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of debate around carbon projects right now and a lot of skepticism. You've probably seen the, the Bloomberg articles and this one published just a week or two ago in the concert, uh, conversation, um, criticizing um, baselines that are used in the voluntary market system, um, making the argument that even though we're, we're paying landowners a lot for these offsets, they might not be yielding actual increases in carbon storage on the landscape, and therefore the climate benefit may not be clear. My point is that there's a lot of debate around this. And to make a long story short, this is certainly worthy of, of further scrutiny. We, we need to revisit the issue of baselines, we need to continuously improve those to tighten them up. And we do as a profession need to ensure that, that the carbon and climate benefits of carbon projects are real, that, there are re that there's real additionality. And I know I'm almost out of time, so I'll just finish up with the next couple of slides really quick. Uh, this has gone on far longer than I, than I meant it to. So we're onto the last test now. I'll do, try to do this one quickly. Test number four, does the production of durable wood products help make forests future adapted 
and resilient to uh, disturbances and other risks. So I'll, maybe I'll just use this one example for today, uh, obviously one that's very important in the Northwest, uh, the example being fire risk reduction. So we're, we're all familiar with the mega fire issue. We all understand the importance of fire restoration treatments, any from below the canopy, uh, fuels treatments, prescribed burning, um, those sorts of things. This is a little tricky to understand from a carbon standpoint, but that type of, of forestry has real carbon benefits. And um, Matthew Hurtow and his colleagues have shown this very clearly in, in their work in the Southwest and Ponderosa Pine Forest. I'm borrowing their slide here, but, but what you're seeing modeled or simulated <clears throat> over 50 years is the, is the total ecosystem carbon from a range of, of fire restoration treatments. The bottom lines are sort of like, what happens if you do nothing? The carbon, the carbon storage on the landscape stabilizes pretty quickly because of all the carbon fluxed by mega fires and tree mortality resulting from overly dense, overly stressed forests. And the top lines are the carbon outcome if we use things like thinning from below in combination with prescribed burning. And yes, these things result in an initial dip in carbon, a reduction in carbon off the landscape as we treat those fuels, but over the long term, they result in an increase in net carbon storage. And this happens because of reduced tree mortality in the long run, as well as the enhanced growth and, and health of the forest that ultimately results in more of that larger fire resistant tree structure that these forests historically had. So there's this net positive carbon outcome in the long term if we um, understand that it's gonna take a little bit of carbon flux in the, in the near term to achieve that. So, I mean, the question is, can we do this kind of fire restoration and still produce durable wood products as a, as a byproduct. And I, I'd be curious in, in your opinion about this, but I understand that there are examples now of, of folks producing cross laminated timber, for example, from a smaller dimension timber that's coming off of fire restoration projects. So there, there, may, be, there may be the potential for um, uh, you know, test number four to, to be validated through fire restoration. Now I'm really pretty much out of time. So I think I won't use my final example today, which is a, an East Coast example of managing forests for, for old forest structure, also is a way to increase resilience to climate change. So a completely different example from a totally different forest type, but I think we'll skip that in the interest of time. Okay, so to wrap everything up, um, here are my conclusions. So I've made this argument that durable wood products um, are, are clearly an important natural climate solution, but they're not the only natural climate solution. They're part of a portfolio. They need to work in conjunction with all the other things that we're gonna we're gonna do to fight, you know, to use forests to fight climate change with. And we need to employ all of these in combination, and we need to spread the risk among them within that portfolio. Um, one way to ensure that durable wood products have a sort of a net positive outcome is to apply these four tests. Um, and then finally, um, this is not a point that I talked about today, but uh, that comes up sometimes in, in certification discussions and, and others is, is that, you know, if we can develop criteria for durable, durable wood products, maybe following my four tests or maybe other criteria, and if we can use those to procure durable wood products from either rigorously developed carbon projects or certification schemes that ensure that the, the tests are being met, you know, maybe that's a way to, to, to do this. Okay, um, so a lot of information. I'm um, sorry for going on for so long, but thank you again for coming. Um, and I welcome any questions in the remaining time. Uh, thanks, Bill. That was great. I, I, as I said earlier, I, I find it like a, a very, very good framework and helpful for me when, when thinking about um, all these conversations that are taking place all the time. Uh, so, you know, I guess my first question to you would be, how should all these 
different stakeholders and people in the arena, procurers, um, project developers, landowners, um, regulators, certifiers, think about this. I know it's a lot of people, so you don't have to answer for all of them, but how would you envision this being applied you know, across, I don't know, the world the, or the US or whatever? Okay, well, thank you for that question. I'll tr try to provide a very specific answer. I've recently been asked to speak to a number of sort of like review boards and task forces in different states, mostly back east, that are trying to figure out what to do with their, their state forests, their state lands. And they're being sort of buffeted by different points of view. You have one constituency arguing that state forests should no longer be managed at all, that they should be set aside as, as strictly conserved preserves. And then you have another constituency arguing that they should be more intensively managed primarily to produce mass timber. My point has always been that it's, it's not either or, that again, we need to take this holistic approach, the portfolio approach, and we need to use these in, in conjunction with one another. We need to think about the entire landscape, the whole, overall mix of strategies, and then you asked me about different um, sort of stakeholders and different ownerships and that sort of thing. We, we need to listen to one another. We need to keep an open mind and listen to these other points of view and then develop a holistic strategy. So I guess that's my short answer. Listen to each other, keep an open mind, and let's work towards that portfolio approach. Yeah, is there anything, this is an interesting one that just popped up. Is there anything bu building designers can do in sourcing mass timber? Th there are a whole variety of really interesting initiatives springing up around the country to help architects and designers with that very question. Um, there's something um, back East called Wood at, no, it's called Wood Works. Wood Works? No, Wood, wood at Work. You can Google it, Wood at Work, which has developed um, sustainability criteria specifically targeted at architects and designers and urban planners. I know that there's a, a, an initiative here in the Northwest, primarily Cal California, but also maybe Oregon and Washington. I think it's called um, like Smart Wood or Smart, Smart Sourcing of Wood or something like that. I can, I can find the, the exact name later. But again, really focused on designers. So um, I'm not doing a great job with this question, but I think that we are, are seeing initiatives developing now that are going to try to provide that kind of guidance to the, to the design world. Thanks, Bill. It looks like Alec is having some technical issues, so I'll jump in to moderate in the meantime. Um, we got a question from Dan Brown in the chat. He says, you seem to imply that Avoided deforestation is equivalent to preservation or passive management. What role does retaining lands in active forest management oh. play as a means of avoided deforestation? I.e., is it possible that avoiding conversion of working forest lands is a valuable carbon forestry tool? Yeah, thank you for making that point. I definitely did not mean to apply that avoided um, conversion is synonymous with passive management. It is not. Um, it's just that carbon markets, especially the IPCC framework, puts those together in one big category. Uh, okay, so the avoided land use conversion and then passive management, meaning developing protected areas is, is one way of doing that. But absolutely uh, just con conservation of working forests, of managed forests is a critical element of avoided forest conversion, particularly where I live, where, I mean, that's the bulk of the conservation work that we're doing is, is conservation easements, for example, on working forests, on actively managed forests. Thanks for that clarification. Thank Since you for the woodworks.org link. Somebody just posted, Matt just posted. Ah, thanks. Um, since you just mentioned easements, I'll pivot to a question from Courtney uh, Bornsworth, are there plans for the Cold Hollow project to place conservation easements on the parcels within the project to protect these lands in perpetuity? And what's the involvement of the Vermont Land Trust in this project? Yeah, so actually all of the lands are under conservation easement. 
that was one of the uh, criteria of the, the uh, of the protocol that we followed. Um, they're all certified. That was another one, FSC certified. Um, and Vermont Land Trust was the primary um, project developer. So was the, was the lead developer. Um, working with my lab at UVM, the Carbon Dynamics Laboratory, and also the Nature Conservancy. But VLT was the lead. Thanks. I love the, the local examples you shared. It's great to hear examples of work in another corner of the country. Um, here's a really quick one that does underlie a lot of this conversation from Mariska. Uh, maybe I missed this in the presentation, but how is durable in durable wood product defined? Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, again, I'm not a wood products guy, which puts me on thin ice with this entire presentation. But, um, you know, durable wood products is a, a broader category. So there we're talking about all structural timber, but also things like furniture. Um, and, and I think actually the Forest Service in their life cycle analysis, their L LCA work, they have a, an extremely loose definition. Uh, anything, any wood product that remains in the wood product stream, get this, for longer than five years. So basically not pulp and paper that ends up, you know, um, somewhere else pretty quickly. Um, so durable wood products, large category, and then mass timber, a subset of that, where we're really talking about large dimension structural timber for construction. That's helpful. Okay, we have two minutes left. Uh, we have one question in the chat, which is a, a pretty big one. So I realize we won't leave you with much time to address it, but um, it's a question about the uh, difference in carbon sequestration between say 100 year rotations and 50 year rotations. That's a question from uh, Martha Welling, acknowledgement that that baseline assumption about um, whether longer rotations store more carbon is um, affects the analysis of whether harvest for timber of a particular age for use as a wood product is a sink or source. And it seems like a fundamental issue. Can you share with us a little about um, why we hear different opinions on that and what the literature has to say about it? Sure. Um, in general, the literature, um, I think, has come to a consensus that extended rotations have an overall net carbon benefit. And it's not just from sequestration. Sequestration is part of it, but really storage is the, is the main thing to look at. Remember, storage is kind of the outcome of sequestration. So if we've had a hundred years of sequestration, storage is the, the, the output, the outcome. And it, from a climate standpoint, at the end of the day, that's what we really care about. We care about the carbon that's down here in the biosphere and not up there in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. So from that standpoint, storage, extended rotations have high benefit. They yield high uh, biomass levels. Of course, there are always things that you can quibble with. So for example, disturbance risks. So if that carries an in increased risk of disturbance, you know, insects, uh, drought tolerance, that's a big concern in Europe, uh, wind, other things, then yes, you'd have to look at that and think about how to manage the landscape overall for you know, resistance to those disturbances. And there is discussion, you know, scientifically valid in many parts of the world around rotations. <clears throat> I'll just use Eastern Europe as an example of a place where they have very long rotations, much longer than in, in the US, like 120 years in beech forests and mixed species forests there. And now they're thinking about shortening those because of some of the uh, disturbance risks, basically. Thank you for the uh, insightful and concise answer to that big question. We are unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you so much for your presentation. That was really wonderful, uh, really helpful to me to think about this sort of framework and questions in my own work and no doubt helpful to others. Um, so thank you so much, Bill. Thanks to attendees for joining us for this session. Quick reminder that our next session starts in 30 minutes at 3.30 Pacific time, which will be watershed function and forest management, the role of forests and hydrologic resilience. We'll see you there. Thanks, Thanks very much.